pastors and teachers, for the, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping and the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God has a plan in the way that he does things to, to build us up, to cause us to, to be perfected in the faith and to be able to grow into what God has called us to be and to equip us for ministry. Everybody in this room is a minister. I want everybody to know that you're a minister of the gospel. Tomorrow, you're going to walk out. These, you're going to walk out. You're walking out. You're being officially ordained today, praise the Lord, by Jesus. He told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the greatest credentials we can ever have. You got the stamp of approval of the Lord. But God places leadership and people in the body of Christ to help lead and to guide and to be there to, to, to equip us and to challenge us and to bring us into a place of maturity. And God uses voices. And that's why we bring other folks into the church. We want them to be able to, to be a confirming voice of the things that you hear here every week. And that God will use these different anointings to stir things up in your life personally. And I'm just so glad today to have Brother Ken with us. It's Uncle Ken, actually. It really is. Uh, he's family. He really is. I talk to Ken probably, what, two or three times a month. I probably talk to him every couple of weeks for sure. And uh, we talk on the phone, and he, uh, we sharpen swords, and we talk. And uh, anyway, he's just family here, and uh, we're so very grateful that he came our way. Uh, and I'm just excited. Amen. So uh, um, I know he's ready to get in this pulpit, and I know he's ready to minister the Word of God. So we're good pullers in this house, aren't we? Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now for Brother Ken and his ministry, fully persuaded ministry. Thank you, God, that he brought, you brought him from Bowling Green, Kentucky here today, God. You've marked this time out in history, God. You knew he was going to be here for such a time as this. So, Lord, right now in this house, we're good pullers. Lord, we just know there's something that you have for us. So, Lord, this morning we set our hearts, we set our face like a flint, God, to receive what you have for us today. We ask you, Lord God, right now to revelate the word to us. Give us eyes, Lord God, to see and ears to hear. And Lord, I thank you right now that Brother Ken's words are like fire and everybody in this house is like wood. So I thank you, God. It's igniting something within our hearts, Father, challenging us, convicting us, Lord God, bringing us to a different place and different realm when we walk out of here. I just thank you, Father, for you blessing us today with your presence so far. And we believe, God, it's not stopping now. And we give you the glory and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Won't you stand to your feet today? Won't you welcome our brother, Uncle Ken? <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor. Is it all right if I just stay down here? Yeah, we'll get you, we'll get you right. a small pickle. Thank we'll you, you, sir. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Well, say this with me. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Above, measure. above measure. I'm a victor. I'm not a victim. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who lives big on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. Wow, I'm so happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to come to, to this wonderful place. Uh, you know, I, I do feel the same way Pastor feels. I feel like I'm family here and I Certainly hope I haven't out, uh, worn out my welcome with you, but we always jump at the chance to come and to share what God's laid on our heart for you precious people. I want to remind you that you are precious people. Amen. And I want to remind you that this is all about you. You know, God never intended for his ministers to be made celebrities. Come on. He didn't say they're to be honored. We want to honor them. But they're never meant to be celebrities. They're never, uh, the focus is not to be on the minister. Right. The focus is that the minister comes to serve you Amen. and to share with you the word so that your life can be better. Thank you so much, brother. Mm -hmm. Bless you. Precious family. Love you guys so much. But uh, this is all about you. The Lord told me that many, many years ago. Here's what the Lord told me to do. He said, now, I've called you to go into churches and I want you to validate the pastor's ministry. In other words, when I go into a place and people come up to me and they say, well, that's what our pastor's been teaching us, then I know I've done my job. Because the Bible says, uh, 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 Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
So we have a planter, and I'm a, I'm a water boy. Amen. And I've got some high-quality H2O <laughs> that I want to throw on this seed that your pastor has, to, has sown. You're right? This church was founded on the Word, and it continues to major in the Word, and it'll never go wrong when it does that. Amen? But uh, let me just share with you, can I give you just a mini uh, sermon number one this morning? I just want to share something with you that uh, struck a note in my heart today. And let me just share something else I've done. Uh, I, I forgot my notes. But, it, but you know what, I've been before the Lord about this for all week long. I, I think I've got them. But anyway, uh, I want to share something with you that the Lord kind of struck in my heart. Let, turn with me to the 8th chapter of Romans, if you will. And we've been talking about, obviously, uh, obviously, the theme this morning that the Holy Ghost would want us to focus on is the love of God. Amen? And let me share this with you. As I go through the body of Christ, I see something in the body. Uh, we don't have a revelation of how much God really loves us. If we did, it would change our lives. If, if we had a revelation of how much God loves us, it would change our thinking. It would change the way we act. And also it would change what we have. Because it's hard. Let me share this with you, you precious people. And we realize that, you know, you're out in the world every day. You know, you're out there and, and you're dealing with this stuff. And I was, I was sharing with Pastor this morning. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. As you get out there, something's going to rub off on you. Amen. And, and the, the reason we come to church is we come to church so we can clean our shoes up. Amen. How many people know when you mess around in a barnyard? I don't care how careful you are. You're going to need to clean your shoes before it's all said and done. Mama's not going to let you in the house until you clean them shoes, right? So we understand that that's where you are, but I want to always let you know that it doesn't matter about your shortcomings and your failures because you cannot separate yourself from the love of God. Amen. We know what to do when we fail, right? We don't run from God, we run to God, right? Here's what we do. We, we just admit it, you know, no need to try to hide it. You know, we just have a flesh moment every now and then, right? I had one the other night in a Walmart parking lot. These things, these things just happen, amen? But we realize that when you stop the bus right there, you don't go any farther. You stop the bus and you deal with that right there with the precious blood of Jesus that does not cover your sin, but it washes your sins away. Amen? The Bible says if we sin, we know what to do. We confess it. He's faithful. Glory to God. He's just. Glory to God. He realizes you're in the barnyard. Every now and then you're going to get something on your shoe that you don't want. But I'm the best shoe shiner in the universe. And we just confess it. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from the unrighteousness. You get it under the blood and you dust off and you move on. on. Praise God. We try to be better today than we were yesterday and we're going to try to be better tomorrow than we were today. Amen? Amen. Right? Little by little we're going to prune the tree and we're going to get it to where it's supposed to be. Praise God. So if you'll look with me in Romans 8th chapter, I just want to throw this in very quickly uh, this morning. This is a verse that I have to go to and I have to go back and I have to reference several times every week and every month in my life, to remind myself of this fact. Look, it's this. In the 38th verse, it says, I am persuaded. Let me share this with you, folks. There comes a time in our lives, in our walk with, the, with God, we have to become persuaded. We can't just hope. We can't just wish. We can't just pray. There comes a time when we have to become persuaded. We have to become absolutely sure. There has to be a conviction that rises up in our heart about some issues in our life. And one of the things is I am persuaded. Paul got to this place that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. Things present nor things to come nor things present, nor things to come. Amen? There's going to be things present, there's going to be things to come. Amen? But watch what he said. He said, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Can't separate yourself from the love of God. Oh, but Brother Ken, I, I did this yesterday. Stop. Get it taken care of. Deal with it like the Word says to deal with it. But it did not separate you from the love of God. Come on. Come on. Amen? Amen? 
It did not separate you from the love of God. You cannot be separated from the love of God. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you, the love of God lives on the inside of you. It's taken up resident. It's like a bow weevil. It's there to stay. Now watch this, go with me to 1 John, I want to tie something in and then I want to get on to what I want to say today. I've got something burning in my heart to share with you. But I just wanted to share this with you because I don't think we talk about the love of God enough. You know, most pastors are always talking about vengeance and, and judgment and you know, they're upset and they have all things on their mind. We don't have a right to do that. We're not the judge. Amen? We're the helpers. We're trying to help you. Amen? So in the first John, let's look right here, and it says this in the uh, third chapter of first John. Let's look in the 20th verse. No, let, no let, let, let's look in the uh, 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 19th verse. Hereby we know in our other truth, and we assure our hearts before him. Let me, I, I want to, what I want you to get out of this sermon, number one, is we've got to come to the place that we're persuaded and we assure our hearts. You have to become assured that my God loves me. And if he loves me, he will not let me stay sick. If he loves me, he will not let me stay broke. If he loves me, he will not let my marriage be in this condition forever. If he loves me, he will not let my children be on drugs. If he loves me, he will do for me what he said he would do because he loves me. And we have a right to go to God and we have to say, Father, I know you love me and I'm here to, to draw on that love right now. Amen. I need some love here. Show me some love this morning, Lord. Then it says, but if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Well, you missed a chance to shout right there, honey. Because I know that I'm sitting in the midst of people who have, you're, you've condemned yourself. Well, I failed, I didn't, I should have, would have, could have. And you're condemning your own heart. But notice this, God's greater than your heart. Amen. In other words, the Bible says mercy rejoices against judgment. Then it says this, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things, beloved. But if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. I want to share this with you right here. If you get a revelation for the love of God, your prayers will begin to be answered. If you don't have your prayers answered on a consistent basis, it's because you're not assured of the love of God. Because look at the next verse. It says, and whatsoever we ask. If God does not, if a heart doesn't condemn us, then we have confidence. In other words, when you get confident in the love of God, your faith grows. Right. What, faith works by? Love. Let me share this with you. you don't, this is a revelation to me that the Lord showed me. He said faith works by love. You know how it works? It works by you getting a revelation of his love. Yeah. When you realize how much God loves you, your faith goes out the roof. It's off the chain. It's off the charts. Right. Amen? I'm about to take a running spell here. There's a Pentecostal leg kick right in there somewhere, right there. Glory to God. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm trying to maintain here. We're live streaming. I don't want to act silly on, all over the world, but I'm about to act silly right here. Glory to God, because my heart don't condemn me, praise God. I know when I ask God something going to his word, I know he's going to give it to me for no other reason, because he loves me. When my kids come to me and they ask me for something, they know I'm going to give it to them. Why? Because I love them. Hallelujah. So then if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence. And now notice it, and it said, whatsoever things you ask, you might get it. Whatsoever thing you ask, if he's in a good mood, what does it say? Whatsoever things we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You want to get your prayer answered? Assure your hearts. Be persuaded that he loves you. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, I have officially preached myself happy. <laughs> Praise God. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. The Hallelujah. Maybe I'll come back sometime and we'll just do, do, do that whole thing. But I, I've just been, I persuaded myself that my God loves me. Now, people get mad at you if, you if you're in churches that are don't, not founded on the Word because they think you're being arrogant. But see, they just don't understand. God loves us. 
Uh, how many people in here would give your only begotten child to die for someone else? Not just die. You know, it would have been different if he, you know, Jesus came and just had a massive heart attack and just fell dead, you know. But he didn't die like that. He suffered. He was, he was suffered. He was beaten. And God had to look at that. You know what he kept reminding himself? I love them so much that I'll let him do that. Wow. I love them so much that I'll let my son, who never sinned, I will let him become a sinner for them. I will let him pay the price that they deserve. I will let him do for them what they could not do for themselves. I will let his visage be marred more than any man's. They couldn't even recognize Jesus because he was beaten till he could not recognize him. God said, I'll let him do that. He asked Jesus, will you do it? He said, yeah, I'll do it. He said, well, I'll let you do it. But then he said, it is finished. When it was finished, it was finished. God raised him up. He saw no corruption. He raised him up and said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I am he that was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. Glory to God. Now I'm going to ascend to the place where I came from, and I'll be seated at the right hand of the Father until he tells me, go get my children because I love them so much, I want them up here with me. And I love them so much that I'm going to raise them up now spiritually and seat them in heavenly places with Christ. So as far as I'm concerned, they're right over here with me now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Sometimes it's just hard to speak in English. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look with me in the 11th, but I've got to move on because, my goodness. The 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, I want to talk to you today about an issue that uh, I have seen in the body of Christ, and I just want to share this with you, and I believe it will help you. In 2 Corinthians, the second chapter and the 11th verse, it says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. For Satan would not get an advantage on us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan has certain devices that he places in your life, and he's trying to get an advantage. Amen? So then, it, it, we're not ignorant. You see, this is, this is where many Christians fail. They fall. They're lovely people. God loves them. They're covered by the blood. But because they're ignorant, you know, that word ignorant, that's fighting words today. But really what ignorant means, it means a lack of knowledge. It means actually in, in the Webster's, it means a lack of, uh, lack of knowledge or understanding about a particular subject. And so we, we're not ignorant of his devices. Amen. Now, turn with me, if you would, to uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I just want to, I want to start on these three, and then we'll, we'll talk about some other things. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we want to read something here. Hallelujah. Uh, the Lord has talked to me about this all week. He's concerned about his people. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, says this in the tenth verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Listen precious people. Quit trying to be strong in yourself. And quit being. Critical of yourself. When you're not strong. Amen. Quit putting yourself down. Because you've, you're, you're weak in some areas. We're all weak in some areas. You know we're, we're told to be strong in the Lord. So that tells me there. That there is a strength that's available to us. Now listen, let me share this with you very quickly as we go into this because the Lord's been dealing with me about this and, and I can't get off of this is the fact that many people have bought a lie when they say God is in control. All right? I was preaching recently in North Carolina and I was preaching along these lines and a lady just spoke up in the service. She said, now preacher, you do know that God's in control. I said, honey, if he is, he's doing a poor job. I said, have you seen what's going on out there? Huh? Has anybody watched Fox News lately? 
you ought not watch that junk, but when you do, you'll find out that if God is in control, he's, he's lost control somewhere, right? <laughs> Amen? I said, honey, if God was in control, we don't need faith. Come on. Why do we need faith if God's in control? Why don't we just go home, sit down on the couch, twiddle our thumbs and say, now, Lord, we're just waiting on you. Huh? You're in control of this now. Honey, let me share this with you. You'll be sitting there next week. Still saying, well, now, Lord, when are you going to do something about this? And the Lord's saying, when are you going to do something about this? The head can't do anything without the body. That's right. You got to understand, I'm the head's up here. The body's down there. You cut my head off, it ain't going nowhere. My body don't take it. So then, we say God's in control. Well, the Bible says be strong in the Lord. Well, if, if he was in control, wouldn't we all better be strong? I had a lady come down to me and talk to me like this. She said, I want you to lay your hands on me. And I said, well, do you believe when I lay my hands on you, God will heal you? She said, well, I don't know, but God's in control. I said, honey, if he was in control, you'd have never been sick. And let me share this with you. If he is in control and you're sick, then you're wrong by trying to get out unsick. I mean, if he's in control and you're sick, then you need to say, hallelujah, it's the Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, it's the Lord. The Lord made me sick. And he's in control. I got to stay sick. And if you're broke, honey, if you got a job, you're out of his will. Because if he's in control, you need to stay broke. Huh? If you're depressed, you don't need to go lay on the couch and go, it all started as a small child. If you're depressed, you need to stay depressed because he's in control. And if he's in control, why did he say, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as you soul prosper? If he's in control, he said, I wish. If you're in control, you say, I told you to be prosperous. <laughs> Wasn't that what he said? I told you to be well, right? He said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. Notice this. Even as your soul. There's a catch to this. In other words, the level of your soulish mind, the level of the prosperity in your mind will dictate the level of your health and your prosperity. Come on. Come on, kid. Amen? There's whole, there's perfectly whole. If I got my choice, I'm taking perfectly whole. The word perfect means a level where there can be no improvement. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Watch this. Put on the whole armor of God. Now if he's in control, why would he have you do something? If he's in control, you don't need armor. Put on the whole armor of God, watch this, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not ignorant of his devices. You know what another word for wiles is? Devices. Right? So then Satan has devices that we need to understand. Correct? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians again. Let's look in the 10th verse. This is the three foundational scriptures here in this teaching that you've heard many, many times before. But we're just putting water on it. Amen? Watch this now. When I realized that you'd already heard this before, it took the pressure off me. Watch this. Third verse. For though we walk in the flesh. How many people got some flesh going on? We walk in the flesh. We do not war or operate or function in fleshly ways. Let me share this with you. Christian people, blessed, blood-washed people of God, quit trying to do these things on your own. You can go so far. The Tower of Babel people went so far. There is a place you can attain in your own strength. You just look. There are, here's, what, here's what people say. I'm a self-made millionaire, right? Well, in a way, they, some of them are. But let me share this with you. They don't realize who gave them the ability to do that. Right? Somebody gave them business sense, and it wasn't the Wharton School of Business. It was the Holy Ghost. 
So we don't war after the flesh. Watch this now. For the weapons of our warfare, what do we say? Armor, weapons of our warfare are not mighty, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? You know what another word for strongholds is? Strategies, wiles, devices. It says casting down imaginations. Did you see that? Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Did you see that? Satan will never come and do anything but try to exalt himself against the knowledge of God. He'll always come against the knowledge of God. In other words, when Satan comes into your life to try to kill, steal, and destroy, he's, he wants to know one thing. Where are you at knowledge-wise? Where are you at faith-wise? Let me share this with you. What did Jesus tell Peter? Satan would have you that he would sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith would not fail. Did you see that? You know what Satan wants to know? Where are you at faith-wise? And he brings these things into your life to find out. The word sift means to winnow. If you, uh, I, we're agriculture where I'm from. We don't call it winnow anymore. We call it threshing. Right? You know what threshing does? Threshing comes in, it cuts it down, it separates the, 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 it separates the grain from the corn, the husk, it separates it from that. But it does another thing. It also takes the chaff, which is the protective layer around that grain, right? It, it takes that chaff off and blows it out the back and puts the genuine grain in the hopper on the combine. So what it does? Well, here's what he said. Satan wants to thresh you. What he wants to do, back in those days they had a fork. They waited for a real windy day. They would take the fork. They would throw the wheat up in the air in a windy day. What the wind would do was it would separate the chaff because it didn't weigh anything. It, it didn't have any substance. Wow. It wasn't genuine. Okay. And the wind would take that that was a substitute that was not genuine. It would blow it away. But what came back down was what was genuine, was what was real. It was valuable what came back down. So God, uh, Jesus said, what he wants to do, Peter, is he wants to throw you up. It's a windy day. How many people have the, the devil come in and blow, huff and puff and try to blow your house down? What he's doing, he's going to throw you up and see if you'll just blow away or if you'll come back down and say, is that the best you got? Come on. That's good. That's good. Amen. He said, I prayed that your faith would not fail. And here's what Peter did. And when he got under the gun, he threw him up in the air. He denied him three times before the rooster ever crowed. You know what happened? He threw him up in the air and Peter just blew away. So many Christians today, what he's coming into our lives to do, he just wants to throw you up and see what comes back down. And he uses strategies. He uses, he uses devices to do that. But one day when Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost after the day of Pentecost, he came back in and they said, these men are drunk. These men are drunk. But Peter, he got thrown right back up in the air, but this time he came back down. He said, no, no, no. They're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet. Preached a sermon and 3,000 people got saved. Well, everybody gets blowed away every now and then. But honey, we don't have to stay blowed away. Huh? Sooner or later, we don't get ignorant. We, we realize, oh, you done throwed me up. Uh-uh, you're not throwing me up no more. Uh-uh. You're not throwing me up again. Because you done done that. We done been down that road. Amen? I tell people all the time, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you'll do something about your situation. Glory to God. Oh, Lord Jesus. All right, here we go. Sometimes I wish God would do for me what he did back in the old day. He turned that clock back. So I want to talk to you today about one of the devices that Satan uses against us. It's the device of distraction. I want to talk to you today about distraction. The word distraction means to have your attention drawn away from one subject to another. And what Satan is trying to do, what did he say? He exalts himself against the knowledge of God. 
the first thing Satan is going to do is he's going to come and try to get you off God's word. He's going to try to get your eyes back on your circumstances, back on your situation. He's try, he, 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 he tried to get Jesus back on his situation. Aren't you hungry? You've been out here 40 days without food. Now, I don't know about you, but right now I'd be having visions of whoppers. <laughs> Amen? I would. I, I'd be having visions of whoppers, you know, and they would be a whopper, too, after 40 days. Amen? I'd be having visions of Twix. Look like a football. <laughs> Amen? And he come down and he said, aren't you hungry? What was he trying to do? He was trying to get Jesus' eyes off God. On to his physical problem right there that he had. But Jesus was up to the task. He was not ignorant of his devices. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? And you find out that Satan came back two other times. We find out in this story, Satan talked, Jesus talked. Satan talked, Jesus talked. Satan talked. Jesus talked. Satan left. <laughs> Amen? What do we learn? You don't ever quit talking. You're not ignorant of his devices. You're not going to stop until he leaves. For a more opportune time, it says in the Amplified. He's coming back. He's got short-term memory loss. Amen? Amen? So then turn with me to Luke, the 10th chapter, if you would. And we want to look at a story today that will absolutely chronicle what I'm saying to you. Luke, the 10th chapter, let's start in the 38th verse. It says, It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Let me stop right there just for a moment and share this with you. When I first read this story, when I first started studying the Bible, reading the Bible, I had this, this in my mind that here was Jesus, he was teaching, Mary was seated at his feet, hanging on every word, but Martha was running around like a chicken with her head cut off. But this says that she, all, she had a sister which also sat at his feet. This tells me that at the outset of this story, both Martha and Mary were seated at the... What, is that not what it, refer, it implies to you? Said she had a sister who also sat at Jesus' feet. And I thought, the Spirit of the Lord said, Honey, Ken, both of them started out hearing the word. Right? Martha just wasn't up running around. Let me share this with you. If Jesus came in, you'd be wanting to be up running around too. Huh? For good reasons and bad reasons. Huh? Let me go hide my 357. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> anyway, so we have two ladies sitting here listening, hearing Jesus teach the word. But something happened. Watch this. In the middle of the sermon, watch what happens. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. Let me, let, me, let me give you another word for cumbered. In the New Living Translation, it says she was distracted by the, uh, wait, let me remember. She was distracted by the circumstance and the situation. In other words, here's Martha and Mary they are seated listening to Jesus. They're focused. Their attention is on Jesus. But suddenly, something comes into Martha's mind. I bet it came into Mary's too. But all of a sudden, Martha begins to let her mind, what? Drift away. I had a lady not long ago. She told me this. I, I, I was preaching in my dad's church about two months ago, and I saw a lady who had had some health issues that I hadn't seen in a while. And so, I, 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 in fact, I waved at her uh, while I was preaching. I said, good to see you. So anyway, at 12 o'clock, uh, the holy hour, we cut it off. Because after 12, you have to preach with your shoes off, because you're on holy ground then. 
And so at 12 o'clock, we cut it off. And so uh, I, I had a couple of people come down and set up work. And I wanted to go see her because it was good to see her. And she was gone. Well, she came to the nursing home. At that time, my dad was in the nursing home. He's had some health issues. And she came to the nursing home. And I saw her. And I said, honey, I'm sorry I didn't get to see you today. I, I wanted to get to you and see you, but I got to talk. And she said, you do know at 12 o'clock it's time to eat. And she said, and I went to eat. I said, well, I said, well, was it good? I mean, what else you going to say, right? So here's what I found out. A lot of people in church, they'll hang with you till 15 minutes to 12. And then they're thinking, what restaurant we going to go to today? I hope we don't get behind all them Baptists. They eat every fried chicken. There won't be no fried chicken left. But not, if there's any Baptist listening to me today, I'm just kidding with you. I, I, just, let me, uh, I forgot we were on. I, oh, Lord Jesus. I, I extend to you my humblest apologies, all, all of my Baptist brothers and sisters. We love you because we know that if you go to a Baptist church, you will get saved. That's why I'm not a pastor. You understand that, right? <laughs> My wife tells me, you don't ever know when to keep your mouth shut, do you? I said, no, I don't guess I do. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and, and, and what happened to Martha, she got to thinking, you know, this is just not anybody that has graced me with his presence. This is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. This is the only begotten of the Father. This is the bright and morning star, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the holy one, the sinless one. He is the one that bore the sin of the world. And here I am sitting here, I need to get up and I need to make his stay here the most pleasant stay he's ever had. Let me share this with you. Satan does not always use evil things to distract you. Martha's intentions were perfectly whole. They were perfect. They were good intentions. They really were. But Satan began to talk to her and said, you do know who this is. And here you are sitting. You need to cook the best meal he's ever had. You need to get your best set. Don't, don't be putting them paper plates out there. Don't be putting them Dixie cups out there. This calls for your finest china, your finest silver, your finest crystal. And her love for Jesus, she began to operate in what she thought was love. But Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, let me go say that on this side. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? In other words, don't give me lip service. Show me the love. And the way you show me how much you love me is that you will keep my commandments, right? Well, we got Martha. All of a sudden, she wanted to show her love, but she left the commandments. She was distracted. She was distracted. Satan took her out. He took her out of the word. He took her away from the teaching. He took her, but Mary never budged. She stayed right there. Amen? He, 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 see, she, she, see, we've all got good intentions. And they're not, let me share this with you. It's not wrong for us to go to ball games. See, we've got to quit preaching these things. We gotta we gotta quit putting bondage on people. We gotta we gotta quit putting condemnation on. There is nothing wrong at all with going to your children's ball games at all. Nothing wrong at all for doing all this. But let me share this while you're there between any say, thank you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you that I was able to come. I thank you we had gas in our car. I thank you, Lord, that we had money to buy snacks. I thank you, Father. The Bible says in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being, seeing that he gives life and breath to us all. Amen? So in other words, while you're there having fun, thank the Lord in the middle of that. Father, I just thank you for this. This is memories that'll, that can't be taken away. I'm making memories with my children here. 
But she left the word. And she began to do these things. And she began to get distracted. Now, turn with me if you would to hold your place there. Let's look in, let's look in Matthew here. I just want to share this verse with you. Look in the sixth verse, uh, sixth chapter of Matthew. And let's look in the 21st verse of this. Let's look in the 21st verse. It says in the King James, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Did you see that? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now let me share this with you from, uh, from my take on this. What's most valuable to you, what's most important to you, what draws your attention, it draws your, your mind, there will your heart or your mind be. Your focus, your attention will be there. Well, suddenly in the midst of a word, I just wonder what the Lord was saying. Honey, listen, if he were to come in here and, 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 and talk, what would he say? I would not want to leave. But somewhere along the line, her treasure became her serving him. Wow. Wow. Amen? Her treasure became the meal. It became the cleaning of the house. Everything, her servants, Somebody had to oversee the service. You see, got to understand something. These women were loaded. They were not poor. They were not in a, well, I'm going to hush now. They were loaded. They had servants. And she began to go in and take control. She began to micromanage this thing. And what it did was it took her out of the Word of God. It removed her out of that. Now, watch this. Go back over to Luke. It says, She was cumbered about much serving, and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Notice this. Satan got her so distracted, she tried to distract her sister. And notice this. I can't, I can't go there. This will be the, the, this is sermon number two, three. I don't want to go there, but notice this. The first thing that distraction does, it takes you out of the word. The second thing distraction does, it causes you to become offended. And notice this. If you ever, you ever, you ever talk to people who are distracted, their minds go in all different directions. And, 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 and they, what does it It causes confusion. And then it caused her to be. It caused Mary to be uh, Martha to be offended. Not only at Mary, she was also a little ticked at Jesus. She said, "Don't you care?" <laughs> huh? Notice she didn't address Mary first. Huh? She went to Jesus and said, "Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone?" She was offended. All right, now, very quickly turn with me to James, the third chapter. Let me show you what distraction does. It takes you out of the Word, takes you away from the Word. And look in James, the third chapter. Hallelujah. I'm not boring you, am I? Okay, just want to check. I had a teacher, a pastor got mad at me recently. He said, now you know that teaching stuff. If I'd have known you was a teacher, I'd have never had you. He said, because that teaching stuff don't go good around here. I said, well, I'm not going to say what I said. Here we go. Watch this now. 14th verse of the third chapter of James. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. Did you see that? Anytime you get ticked off at somebody, that's the devil's playground. Watch this. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion, and every, 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 every evil work. In other words, when you get in envy and strife, 
You just open the door for the devil to do everything he's capable of. Every evil work. Everything the devil has at his disposal can be found in envy and strife. You see people who are ticked off all the time, they're the sickest people, they're the brokest people. Everything Satan can do will be done in that person. I had a pastor call me recently. I was going to preach for him on Sunday. He called me on Thursday. I'm canceling you. A friend of mine from Bible school came into town and I'm canceling you and letting him preach. I hope you're not offended. I told him, I said, Pastor, I'm unoffendable. I said, because I can't afford to be offended. I hung up. You know what the Lord said? When was he ever your source? He said, who is your source? I said, you are. He said, don't worry, take a week off. I'll pay you well. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> I'm telling you, I went to the mail. No, actually, I got on my website, and I looked. It's, and when I looked again, and I had to look again, and I had to look again. I said, thank you for the vacation. <laughs> now look with me real quickly in the first chapter of James. One of this gets plain here. Now, I won't get no amens here, but i got to share this with you, and then we're going to go on back to Martha. Watch this now in the first chapter of James. It says, but in the sixth verse, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. You know what that, another word for wavering is? Distracted. You know what wavering means? It means to hesitate. It means to hesitate among two or more options. It says, If any of you let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now here's the one I don't get amens on. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Now I guarantee you James had some folk leave his church when he preached that one. Amen. So you can't preach stuff like that anymore. People get offended. They'll leave your church. But the Bible says if we waver, if we're not persuaded, if we allow ourselves to become distracted here, there, here, there, here, there, all our mind off of everything but the word, it says that we're like a wave of the sea. The wind blows us. What do we say? Winnow. It just blows us away because we're wavering and we cannot even expect to receive anything from the Lord. And then when we get there and we don't receive from them, what do we do? We get offended at God. Why did the Lord let that happen? Why didn't the Lord do what he said he would do? Why is it that sister so-and-so got blessed, but I'm still in this situation? And then we begin to say, that faith stuff don't work. That word stuff don't work. We're offended because we wavered and we allowed ourselves to become distracted. Okay, let's go on. Go back to, go back to Luke. We're, I got to finish this. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm hurry. I'm going to hurry. Here we go. What's this? She said, do you not care? Bid her that she help me. Watch what he said in the 41st verse. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. Did you see that? Honey, listen, I'm probably talking to people right now that's right there. You're careful. You're troubled about many things. You got things going on in your life, and about the time you put one fire out, another one breaks out. You ever been there? Seems like every time you turn around, you know, and here's what we say, what else can happen? Well, honey, there's a whole lot more that can happen, let me tell you. I, I don't want to burst your bubble, right? <laughs> And, 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 and we're, that's, we get to the place to where, you know, just one thing after another, our mind gets so troubled, we get confused, we don't know what to do, we don't know how to do it, you know, we're just, and we're, we're, we get ticked off, we, we lose our patience, we're not real fun to be around anymore, right? You know, I know, but it says... You're careful and troubled about many things, but oh, let me tell you, I don't know if you can mark in your Bible or not, but you can underline these next, next five words if you, if you can. But one thing is needful. Glory to God. 
Notice what Jesus was saying. He said, you're troubled about many things, but right now there's only one thing that's needful. Amen. Let me share this with you. You may have all kinds of things going on in your mind. You may be trying to figure out what you're going to do, how you're going to deal with this, but I'm telling you there's only one thing that's needful in your situation. You know, in other words, you don't have to have five different things. You don't have to go through seven steps to solve this problem. You don't have to go through ten steps to overcome this. Here's what you need. You need one thing. There's only one thing that's an answer to every problem that we have, but it's a matter of what we we're going to focus on. Are we going to allow our problems to, to dictate what we focus on? Is our problems going to be what we treasure? Or are we going to be able to treasure the thing that can help us? We get our minds off that. We need to tell these things. I will not be distracted by you anymore. If I go under, I'm going under looking at what's needful. Amen? What's this? And Mary has chosen that good part. Glory to God. Notice this. Jesus didn't say it was evil to eat. I'm so glad that he said that. Amen? He didn't say that it's evil to clean your house. He didn't say that it was evil to make sure everything was just right. He said, there's a time and place for everything. But right now, right now, this is what's needful. And Mary has chosen. If God was in control, when do we have a choice? If he's in control. Mary has chosen that good part, here we go, that cannot be taken away. Right to God <laughs> cannot be taken away. So then, he, what he's saying is, dinner can be taken away, a clean house can be taken away. If you got grandkids like we got, a clean house ain't got a chance, huh? Listen, they put dirt where I never believed dirt could ever be. <laughs> I'm telling you. They come in my house. I told my wife, I said, get ready. The house will be terrorized. She said, I know it. <laughs> right? I mean, at Christmas time, we, had to have, we didn't have any ornaments on the lower half of our tree. <laughs> we had the weirdest looking Christmas tree. I mean, there wasn't nothing up from all the way up. And then we had them up here. And, and Stella Jane was trying her best. She's figured, I could look at her. <laughs> Connie said, what's she doing? I said, she's trying to figure out how to get up there. I said, make sure there's no ladders in the house. She will get there. But you got to do what you got to do. Right? But he said there's only one thing needful. And Mary chose. I'm just trying to get you folks to do this for me. Make your choice right. I know you got situations going on. But there's a choice. This will get your kids off drugs. This will get that cancer out of your body. This will make your, this will clean you, this will, this will fill your checkbook up. I want to close today in the third chapter of Acts, if you'll allow me to do that, and we'll go home. Glory to God. Are you getting anything out of this? Let me share this with you a lot of times. See, I love coming to churches like this because you, you got to understand, churches like this, this is what they do. They let you understand that God loves you, but the responsibility is not all, all on God. Let me share this with you. God has already provided everything that you'll possibly ever need. Amen? In this covenant, it's not like Adam and Eve where they didn't have to have faith because they saw everything. When God comes down and talks to you in the cool of the day, you don't have to have faith. I don't have to have faith when I see Pastor Paul. When he tells you of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat except one. They didn't have to have faith. They didn't get up in the morning and go, well, let's pray that there's some food. It's right there, Eve, go get some. Right? But then Satan came in, what did he do? He exalted himself a half God said? 
hath God said? And he distracted them with power and honor and position. You'll be just like him. Listen, they knew God. And if anybody told you you'll be just like him, my goodness, you'd jump at the chance too. Think about it. She went, Adam, she went, you know, like my wife does when she's trying to get my attention. Right? We can be in praise and worship. And my wife will have a thought. She'll go, I said, don't mess with the anointing right now. <laughs> so she elbowed at him and she said, you do know that we can be like him. You've seen what he did. You've seen his ability. You saw him. He created every animal. Did you not see him create those animals? And then he brought them to you and said, what do you call them? Whatever you call them. I thought he was in control. Whatever you call them, that will be the name thereof. And he, and he said, Adam, listen to me. This is what my wife said. She'll go, listen to me. We can be like him. And Adam thought, cool. <laughs> Deal. And here's what happened. We're here today in this mess that we're in. I had a pastor tell me recently when I get to heaven, he said, I was praying. I told God when I get to heaven, I'm going to give Adam a piece of my mind. He said the Lord spoke to him and told me, told me and said this, no, you're not because if he hadn't blown it, you would have. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you leave the throne room going, okay. <laughs> so think about it. Let's don't be bad at Brother Adam. Think about it. That was a great deal. He took it. It was the wrong deal. He chose the bad part. He didn't choose the good part that could not be taken away. All right, very quickly, let's, let's close here. At Acts, the third chapter. You know this story backwards and forwards. I just want to show you something the Holy Ghost showed me. Now Peter and John went up together, first verse, into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, obviously there's several people entering. It's just like on a church service today. You stand at that front door, there's several people coming in, right? They just keep coming. This man was there. He had, this is his goal. I'm going to ask for money for everybody that comes in the door. So you can imagine what he was doing. Everybody's coming in. His attention was going from this person to that person to that person. to the, He did not want to miss one person coming in, right? He wanted to make sure that he gave everybody coming in the opportunity to help him. Because everybody he missed, he, there was a, the, he missed the potential from getting some money that he needed. So you could probably understand, he was doing this and that and this and that. He was wanting to make sure. He was lame. He, he couldn't just walk around, so he had to make sure he was seeing everybody, right? So you can see what his attention was. Watch this. When seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple, he asked an arm. And Peter, fastening him eyes on him with John, said what? Look on us. Here's what he was saying. Focus on us. Put your attention on us. Isn't it amazing that a lot of times in our lives, in our Christian walk with the Lord, we've got things going on in our life. We've got children issues. We've got marriage issues. We've got financial issues. We've got employment issues. We've got everything. And our minds are going all over the place. And what God is trying to say is, look at me. Right? When we've got everything going on in our life, and it seems like what else could happen? What God is saying, quit looking at that and look on me. When Jesus went out there, he was feeding 5,000 people. They said, how can we do this? All we've got is a Captain D's two-piece fish dinner. This little brother went by the drive-thru, got a Captain D's two-piece. How in the world are we going to finish it? He said, bring it to me. Hallelujah. He said, look on us. And watch what happened. 
he became focused instead of distracted. And he said he gave heed to them. What's this? Expecting. <laughs> you know what God's saying? Look at me and expect. Look at me. He said, look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter made this statement. What you think you need, I don't have. But what you think you need is not that good part. That can be taken away. In fact, if you get some of that today, you'll be back tomorrow because that will be taken away. But what I've got for you can't be taken away. Right now, what you don't need, money, because money will fix your situation for one day. What you need is something that will fix it for the rest of your life. He gave heed to him, expecting to receive something. And Peter said, what I've got will fix your problem and you won't have to ever be here anymore. And he was expecting. His faith went out the roof because he had his faith in all these other things that distracted him. But when he put his faith on that which was important, on that which could not be taken away, there was no problem in getting him healed. He said, he just reached in him. He said, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. He said he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, walking and leaping, entered into the temple with, with John and Peter and John, walking and leaping and praising God. Because he focused on what could not be taken away. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I'm just about ready to shout, praise God. You know, I tell the devil, ah, oh, you can't have my attention. Talk to the hand. I don't care how bad it is in my life. We got issues going on in my life. There's issues. Mm -mm. You can't have my attention. My attention is focused on you because that won't, I can't solve that. I can't solve that. I don't have that. I don't have that, but you got it. So I, my mind is on you who can solve my situation. And I'm not taking my eyes off of you until it's solved. Amen? Because I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be taken out of the Word. Now listen, let me share this with you. It didn't mean I, they don't try. It, 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 it don't, and it don't mean that every now and then I'll catch myself running over here. Oh, whoa, ho, ho. I'm going in a bad direction here. Let me get back over here, get my eyes back on what I ought to have my eyes on. I said, Lord, if you can't solve it, it can't be solved. I'm going to bed now. Bye-bye. Good night. I'll have my people call your people. Amen? So then, let's focus, folks. Let's put our eyes on what is most important that can't be taken away from us. And let's walk in victory right in the midst of bad situations. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord. Say this with me. Thank you, Father, for your word. The Bible says that your word works effectually in those who believe. Father, I believe. So therefore, your word works effectually in me. And what it says will come to pass. I will see the fruit of your word because I'm a believer and not a doubter. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. Glory to God. Very quickly today, if you're here today and, you're, and, and you've got the weight of the whole world on your shoulders, you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with hopelessness because of all these things that have distracted you, if you'll come down, I'm going to lay my hands on you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay my hands on you just like Peter and John in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to break the power of that bondage off you today. If you'll come, we'll believe we'll see it happen. Hi, honey. Praise the Lord. You got some of that going on in your life? You do? Honey, your day has come. The day of peace and contentment and quiet. Here's what you need. Tranquility. You know what peace is? 
It's a, it's a sense of well-being. That's what peace is. Where you know that no matter what this looks like, I know everything is going to be all right. Okay? And here's what I'm going to do. If they could, in the name of Jesus, cause his feet and ankle bone to receive strength, then in the name of Jesus, I can break this bondage off of you. Right? You believe that? God, let's look on him and let's expect. And when I lay my hands on you in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going to break that off of you. Oh, shoot. In the name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness, honey. Now, this is what the Lord is doing right now. He is absolutely, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, He is causing peace like a wave to come into your heart and your mind. He's saying to you right now, honey, now that you've given it to me, you've chosen that good part, which will never be taken away. And I will raise you up over your circumstances and your situation. And I will bring peace where there is right now. There's tumult. There's worry. There's stress. So do not worry, my sister, for my peace shall overcome that. And you will walk free from it from this day forward in the name of Jesus. Mm. Oh, Lord, honey, listen up. We don't go by our feelings, but we don't run them good ones off either. Remember that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. All right. Well, know this, you precious people. I love you guys. Thank you for having me back. Thank you, Pastor. Love you. Bless you. You're a good woman. Strong in the Lord. Power of his mind. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Huh? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. You're shielded. You're protected. My hand is upon you. I'm with you. I'll walk through this with you. You don't ever have to fear, for I'll never leave you. I'll be with you. My power, my spirit, my might is with you. And when the enemy comes and tries to steal that from you, look up, my sister. Look up, my precious daughter, because my hand is right there. And I will bring you through in victory. Thank you, Pastor. You guys can be seated just for a moment. We're going to <clears throat> we're give you an opportunity to sow into Brother Ken's ministry. And uh, fully persuaded ministry. We want you guys, if you're making your check out, make it out to FCF. And uh, anybody need to offer an envelope real quick? We want to give you the opportunity to be able to sow into this ministry. It's very important that we do these types of things, that we turn seed out of our hands into the ground. And Ken's a good, hey, listen, that's a quality word he just gave us. It was a quality word. And he always has a quality word for this church, always, always. And uh, we've partook of those spiritual things. And it's just right for us to sow back into him the carnal things, which would be our money, our finances. So I want to give you the opportunity to be able to uh, get your uh, envelopes ready to go. Make your envelopes, fill them out. <clears throat> Helps the counters in the back. They don't like to, well, they will, but it just takes a long time for them to fill stuff out for you. So let's just make sure they, we don't, we alleviate any type of uh, uh, stress on them. So uh, we'll do that. We love you guys. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? Faith arising. Amen. Just faith arising. What are we doing? What are we doing with our faith? Building that faith, speaking the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Let's bless this offering. Father, we thank you so very much for the word of God today that you have given us. And Lord, I know, I thank you. I see in my life, God, things have tried to distract me and where I've got my focus and my vision off. And Lord, I don't want it to lead to places and situations, God. I don't want, I don't want my heart to become hardened in areas. I don't want that. I'll stay focused on you. So right now, God, I just thank you for Brother Ken and Fully Persuaded Ministry. I thank you, God, that you're blessing Brother Ken's ministry. I thank you that his calendar's full. Thank you, Father God, that you're opening doors. Thank you, God, that you're sitting in places, Father. You're sitting in places that never heard this word in this type of degree or this richness. And I thank you, God, you're opening up doors for him. So, Lord, we just so into this today. Believe in you, God, for a great return. Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Esther, let's go ahead and do that.
While you're giving, let me give you a couple announcements real quick. And make sure that you're a member tonight. Growth groups, 6 o'clock. Uh, so get out here. Uh, finance, marriage, prayer, and uh, discipleship. Awesome. This is going to be so much fun. We've got a couple more, and then we'll be off for the summer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, mission, we'll, t we'll take up mission offering next week. If you've done that today, if you remembered and you put that down, it's fine. But uh, we will be uh, uh, doing missions next week. and uh, So I, we forgot to remind everybody about that. Uh, also, if, uh, you need to get signed up for FCF 101 class. This is uh, kind of the, we're going to probably just pull that out, try to get the dates. We've got about four or five or six people that's going to go through it this time, so we're excited. So we'll be doing that, getting people moved in towards membership. Amen? Hallelujah. God's sending people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come here, Maxine. I see Maxine back there. Come here, Maxine. Come here. I want you to give that testimony today. You come up here with me. Come on. Come up here with me. Come up here with me. I want, you, I want to hug you. I want to bring you up here. I want you to I want to hug you. Just want to hug you. So we're going to turn this up. She's going to give you the testimony. Oh, good. I need one more hug. Oh, about, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Pastor Paul had a word of knowledge, and it was for heart palpitations. Well, I didn't know what it was called. I just had this thump, 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 thump thing. Had it for quite a while. That thing went. I have not had anything since. And I just praise the Lord. God's not dead. He's alive. And he looks after us. His eyes on the spare. And it's on me and you and you and you. And you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I wanted her to give that testimony. God's good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Had a great time last week at the baptism. You guys enjoy that? It was good, wasn't it? It was fun. We've never done it like that before, but uh, we learned a couple things, and uh, we it was a little extra work getting the water up here. So, uh, but we we're gonna we're gonna. We'll have a. We'll do something next time. To we're going to cure that for sure. So it was good. We was very careful to let people down in the water. It was almost like it was in slow motion. I said, "T.L., help me now. Just slow." So yeah. Also, oh yeah, celebrating women brunch. We need you get signed up, please. Uh, you got you ladies. Make sure you get out to that make room. Come on, Martha and Mary. We're choosing what the best thing. You can give out a couple hours of your time just to be able to come. and be. We want to bless you that day. Food is provided for you. We want to bless you and bless your life. So please sign up. It's, on, it's next, next Saturday uh, at 11 o'clock. It's a brunch. We want to provide it for you to so come and be blessed. Get signed up the way we can make preparations. Amen? All right, you guys stand up. You're amazing. We love you so much. We thank you so much. Good News Club, huh? Yeah, if you can help in Good News Club, please see Andy. Hallelujah. If you can help that uh, one day, we just really appreciate it. Amen. God is good all the time. What are we going to shout today? Jesus is Lord. Amen. And uh, you guys have a great week, and we'll see you this evening. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. God bless you.